Okay. Um, I guess I guess we can get started, and then maybe some other people will jump in. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining for the Quick Start seminar for this month. Uh, we're having Julie Muck uh, for. Sorry, did I get the name right? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Julie okay, Mock. okay, yes. okay. For the CNC Conservation Program, she is the CNC Conservation Director. It sounds like she has been with the CNC since 2013. Is that right? Yeah, and then, um, so I organized this series with Mike Tischer, and if you would like have any topics you'd like to suggest for to present at the QSS, definitely contact us. And thank you to Roger Wendell and Felicia Brower for help with the seminar. The next CNC Quick Start seminar is beginning birding on June 8th, and it's on the calendar now, so you can register for it now. So now I will hand it over to Julie and she can take it away. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. And um, hey, everybody that's out there. Um, since we've got a, a smaller group, I think, you know, if, if you want to turn on your video at all, great. Um, or, or say hi. Um, feel free to do so. Um, like Anna said, my name is Julie Mock and I'm the conservation director for CMC. I'm based down in Salida um, and I've been working for the club since the end of, of 2013, which feels like a long time ago. Um, but we, um, you know, do stewardship and, and advocacy work on behalf of, of CMC and, and all of you as, as members. And I'm just going to kind of run through some of our programs and some of the the work that we've been doing as well as some things that we've got kind of on the horizon and, and down the road. Um, some of you may be more or less familiar with our programs, um, but please do feel free to jump in with with questions along the way. I'll try to um, keep an eye on the chat box or again, you know, if you can unmute yourself and, and just want to jump in and um, ask a question, please, please do. And then we'll certainly have some time at the end for for questions as well. Uh, but let me share my screen here and um, I'll run through a PowerPoint so you guys don't have to stare at my face the whole time. Um, can you guys all see that? Yep. Hopefully. Can see yep. it. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Um, so uh, you guys, you know, may be familiar with, with CMC's kind of history and, and legacy of conservation work, but I think it's important to note that we've been, you know, involved in advocacy and stewardship of, of Colorado public lands really since, since the club's inception. And a lot of our founding members um, and leaders throughout the, the decades um, have been really, really involved in making sure that these incredible places where we go to recreate are um, protected and, and maintained for future generations. And so through the conservation department, we really try to kind of continue that that legacy um, by working with land managers, working with our members and advocates, working with politicians and, and policymakers uh, to make sure that these these really cool places are, are around for um, for us to enjoy and, and for um, the, the sake of the natural resources and um, for, yeah, again, future kind of future generations and future CMC members to enjoy. Just a little um, kind of outline for, for our department. Um, you, are, you know, we're sort of what we call a, a mission-driven department in the club. And as such, we actually um, don't receive a, a ton of funding from the, the membership dues that the club receives. Um, we do a lot of outside fundraising, grant writing, and, and fee-for-service work to support our programs. Um, and so a big part of that is, is through our stewardship programs, which I'll talk about in more detail. Um, but they probably, you know, take Take up, uh, I don't know, 70% of our um, budget and our, our kind of efforts on the ground doing trail work and um, restoration work and, and things like that. Again, I'll, I'll touch on in more detail. Um, but the advocacy component is, is also a, a really big and an important piece, the, the policy work and the land, plan, land management planning and sort of advocating and being the voice for human powered recreationists, whether it's on, a, on behalf of kind of hikers or climbers, mountaineers, backcountry skiers, we kind of work to represent all of, all of those groups in, um, again, everything from, from policy that impacts recreation to land management planning, um, and then of course in, in the stewardship realm. 
Um, I'm going to talk to you about our recreation impact monitoring system, which is our, our mobile application that we launched in 2019. Um, and it, it ties into the stewardship and advocacy and in, in helping to connect land managers with information about what's happening out on public land. So I'll, I'll walk through some of the details of that. Um, we're a pretty lean staff and we actually are, are getting a little bit leaner. Unfortunately, we're, we're losing one of our staff members, Brink Messick, um, is going to be moving on at the end of this month. Um, so right now we've got two full-time staff, myself and Connor Marr, who's also based down here in Salida. Connor mainly works on our, our stewardship programs um, and supports some of our, our RIMS work as well, but he's really dealing a lot with our, our crews as well as supporting the uh, Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management down here in the Upper Arkansas Valley. He does um, volunteer coordination and, and scheduling work for, for the agencies as well. So he's he's got a lot on his plate right now. Um, and we do actually have a, an open position if you guys know anybody um, who has a background um, kind of in, in multiple uh, aspects of conservation. We're looking for some stewardship experience. Um, and as well as somebody who can work on our, our RIMS program and, and potentially do some advocacy work as well. So that, that position is posted on the CMC website. Um, again, if you know anybody that's, that's in the field and, and might be interested, please feel free to share it. We'll be looking to fill that position um, sometime this summer. So um, I'll talk about our seasonal crews and our, our snow rangers. But again, these are folks that are on kind of temporarily for CMC. Um, but year round, we've, we've got a pretty, pretty lean staff and a pretty, um, pretty tight budget usually. But uh, we get a lot of work done. So I'll, I'll share some of um, kind of the photos of, of things that we've been doing and, and stuff that we've got on the horizon as well. So I mentioned our stewardship crews and, and they are really top of mind right now. We just had six seasonal staff start. Technically they started last week, but today was actually their first full day of training with us. Um, so we spent uh, a lot of time, about 10 hours working with those guys today um, to get them kind of oriented to CMC um, and, and starting to uh, just understand our, our program and our logistics and risk management and, and all sorts of things. Um, these guys, uh, this, the six we have this year are, are pretty highly skilled. They're coming from a variety of backgrounds. Um, some of them have trail and conservation experience with youth conservation corps um, or with professional agency trail crews. Um, some of them have done more kind of volunteer oriented outdoors work or education work. Um, we've got a pretty cool team and we'll, we'll split them up into two crews. So we have two three person crews um, and they are really their professional trail crews. Um, so they're paid, they're not volunteers. Um, and they're paid basically from, from May when they start training um, through the end of October. They'll complete 20 weeks total of conservation and, and stewardship work across the state. Um, and they'll, again, they, they can do anything from clearing trails. Um, we do cross-cut training and chainsaw training because um, that's just such a big, big need, especially early on in the season. Um, they'll be doing a lot of trail maintenance, some new trail construction. And then we can really train them to do any um, number of kind of technical uh, land management, you know, projects and, and work um, that we that we hear about from from our partners and sometimes that's restoration work sometimes it's fencing work um, sometimes it's hydrology or, or monitoring work so we've done really a, a wide variety um, of, of things with these crews and it's been a pretty cool cool program that's grown quite a bit over the years um, just a snapshot of some of the projects that we've got lined up um, really this year we've got incredible coverage all over the state. They're gonna be moving around a lot. They are based um, here at a Salida. And then they um, pick up and, and go out into the field, typically for four days at a time. They'll camp um, and backpack a lot of times into the, the project locations, the more remote areas where they're working. Um, but they'll be on the Continental Divide Trail, kind of in the, the steamboat area in the Northern part of the state, um, doing both clearing work as well as monitoring and, and data collection. Um, we're doing a big reroute project. Um, if any of you are familiar with Fusas Creek, it's actually close to Salida, kind of partway up Monarch Pass, um, and it's along the Colorado Trail. 
there's a three mile section um, that's super steep and, and just, you know, unsustainable, right? It was a user created trail originally um, and has a, a lot of erosion problems and, and issues. And so we're, we're essentially rerouting that whole section um, and reconstructing a, a new three mile segment that'll connect from Fooses Creek up to the Continental Divide Trail. Um, so we're just, we're starting, it's a two year project. We're starting that this year. Um, and not only do we have our crews working on it, but we're actually contracting with youth cores um, as well as with um, professional uh, timber crews and, and paid trail contractors to do some of this work because it's such a big project. CMC got a grant from the state trails program um, to do this work as well as from the National Forest Foundation and a few other funding sources. All in all, in all it's gonna be, Oh, I think close to a $250,000 project um, that CMC is, is managing um, with all these different partner groups. Um, Colorado Trail Foundation is also involved and we'll have some, some volunteer crews out there um, this summer. So that's a, that's a cool one and a big one um, where CMC is not only, again, having our trail crews out there, but, but providing kind of this coordination role to help the land managers manage such a big project and, and leverage funding, that sort of thing. Doing some work um, up at Square Top, if folks are familiar with that area and, and off of Guanella Pass. Um, and that's a cool one, you know, really in close partnership with our, our Denver group um, trails program and identified a, a need and an area that's popular for CMC members. So we'll have our crew up there for a couple of weeks, um, helping to, to, there's a lot of trail breeding and widening going on and helping to kind of bring all of that onto to one more sustainable route um, and just improve the, um, the, yeah, the quality of, of that trail and, and reduce the negative resource impacts um, from all that, that breeding. Um, and then we do a lot of wilderness, um, just trail maintenance generally, and we've gone back to these um, project sites year after year, you know, and you can see the crosscut saw there. Um, and that's, you know, something that takes a kind of a, a specialty training and, and, you know, specialty crew that can, can get really back into these remote areas, um, move quickly, cover a lot of ground and, and clear trees is a huge part of what they're doing with all the beetle kill these days. Um, they're doing a lot of tree clearing as well as light trail maintenance um, in the flat tops, which is up north, the Sangre de Cristo wilderness in the San Luis Valley and the West Elks over near Cresta Butte, um, as well as the raggeds, I think over there. So um, a, lot of, a lot of wilderness work that takes a lot of, uh, up a lot of our, our time. Any questions on the stewardship program? Not, I don't see if I can see my chat here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. There we go. Um, great. Um, so, another really cool program um, that we started two years ago now um, is our Snow Ranger program. And this came out of um, CMC's Backcountry Snow Sports Initiative. This is part one of our advocacy programs that really focuses on human powered winter recreation, um, dealing with things like winter travel planning and designating where snowmobile use can and can't occur, typically on the national forest because that's where we get the most snow. Um, but this program came out of a partnership with the URA Ranger District, so down kind of towards the southwest corner of the state. Um, and for two years, the last two winters, we've we've run this Snow Ranger program, and we have two seasonal folks that we hire on. Um, they come on usually end of December, early January, and spend three to four months um, working as as snow rangers on the Uri district. This is mainly Red Mountain Pass area, but also the Cimarron Mountains and um, some work out on the Uncompagre Plateau. And really they are kind of operating, they're CMC employees, but they're sort of operating as, as kind of the face of the, the land management agency in the winter. They just, the, the agencies are really understaffed and, and don't, you know, aren't able to hire folks of their own to do this work. So CMC has been able to, to leverage some funding, um, bring in some, some different partners um, to, to bring these guys on. And they, they have a sweet job. I think to go out and, and ski tour and, and snowmobile and, and get into some pretty cool terrain. But a lot of what they're doing is actually just talking with people, um, communicating with users, um, doing visitor surveys, um, collecting data on, you know, where people are coming from, 
from, how they're recreating, what their AVI experience is, that sort of thing. Um, and then they're installing signage and doing other just kind of trailhead maintenance things um, that need to happen in, in the winter as well. Um, so it's a it's a really cool cool program, um, and this is our our second kind of successful winner. We just wrapped up with those guys in the middle of April, um, so it's it's yeah it's really great to have them on board and and have that again kind of boots on the ground component that then matches some of the the advocacy work that we're doing. Um, I did just see a. a question come into the chat here um, about Square Top. And I mentioned um, doing that project in conjunction with the, the Denver group. I think there will be some volunteer opportunities on that project. Um, I don't think it's on the calendar quite yet. We're just finalizing our schedule with land managers, um, but Grover Cleveland has been a part of that project. And so I would look for a volunteer opportunity with him. Um, I'm sure he'll be getting folks out um, to help on, on that project. So Great, great question. Thanks. Any questions on the Snow Ranger program? One thing I'll mention too with these guys, um, we have been focused on the, the Ure Ranger District the last two years. Um, that was in large part because we had funding um, from that, that district of the forest and we were able to, to pair that with some other grants and things. Um, but we are looking to expand it. Um, our I think, but hopefully by next year, we'll be on at least one other district of the um, Gunnison, of the GMUG, the Grand Mesa and Compagre and Gunnison National Forest. Um, so we may have two teams next year. I think our, our kind of secondary goal is to look at areas, um, you know, other areas that are seeing a lot of winter recreation, um, recreation use and perfect. That question just came into the, the chat. Um, so, you know, Areas like Steamboat that are, are just seeing a ton of use, um, Berthed Pass, Loveland Pass, those are sorts of things we're going to be having conversations with those those different districts of the Forest Service to see what the need is and and you know and also understand what other programs are are in place currently. Obviously, we don't want to duplicate anything, um, but to be able to have kind of this capacity on the ground in the in the winter has been um, really helpful for the, the URA district and we're hoping to replicate that in other places. Um, one thing with this program that we did do um, kind of early in the season for the first time um, was host a, a snow ranger summit. Um, and you know, you would you would imagine that, especially through the Forest Service, that you've got these positions in different places that they would communicate with each other. But unfortunately, a lot of times they don't. So these programs tend to operate kind of in a in a silo, right, on one ranger district or in one specific forest. Um, but we were able to bring together about 60 folks um, from across Colorado and actually across the the country um, to come together and and just talk about winter recreation issues how they run their, their snow ranger program. Um, some, you know, like on Vail Pass are fully agency staff. They hire, I think 10 to 12 snow rangers every, every winter. A lot of that's to manage the, you know, the parking and, and the volume of use at the pass itself. But they're also doing this education work, the signage, the patrolling, uh, that sort of thing um, up there. But it's it's all Forest Service staff. Our model is a little different in that we've got you know a nonprofit partnering to, to hire these folks. And then in some places um, they're relying strictly on volunteers in, in more of like a you know a trailhead ambassador sort of role where they're they're out there, they can help with parking, they can talk with folks or you know help direct them on where to go. Um, um, but they're they're not paid. It's all volunteer. So we saw a really broad spectrum of of programs happening, um, and and you know we're able to kind of share information and best practices and resources and stuff. Um, we also had really good presentations from the Colorado Avalanche Information Center and um, Colorado Search and Rescue. And I think you know this this year and and um, 2020 the increase in winter recreation, specifically as a result of COVID, um, was just staggering. And we heard that over and over from different programs across the state. And then of course, from the search and rescue guys and the CAIC folks who are, are kind of dealing with that firsthand. Um, and they, I think we're able to really um, emphasize that the programs like this that CMC is hosting 
really, really help in that user education component. We've got so many new folks out there that, you know, when the ski resorts closed in, in March last year, went out and, and bought all the backcountry gear they, they could and, and didn't necessarily um, get the, the training or, or just haven't had the experience to know how to be safe um, in, in the backcountry. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been, a, it's been great to, to be able to emphasize that and expand that. Um, and hopefully we'll see this program expand to different places next year. Um, I've got a question about whether we coordinate our programs with Colorado, um, with out, volunteers for Outdoor Colorado and the 14ers initiative. Um, and yes, in some cases we do, it depends a little bit on the, the program, but we do, we have partnered both with VOC and CFI in the past, um, whether that's on a, a joint project um, with the Colorado 14ers initiative, we've worked on Mount Elbert, um, and uh, I guess it was the Rocky Mountain uh, Field Institute, on, on Pikes Peak. Um, and then with, with VOC, we've coordinated, you know, some trainings and, and various things. I think each of those programs has a sort of a specific niche, right? VOC really focuses on, on volunteers and engaging folks that way um, for certain types of projects, whereas we're sending a, a, you know, kind of smaller professional crew for a, a different type of, of project and effort. And then CFI Colorado 14ers initiative is, is really just focused on, on the 14ers, which of course are a, you know, a huge draw for, for CMC members. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's opportunities and, and we're kind of, you know, coordinate, coordinating with them as things overlap, but then also working, you know, independently and, and autonomously. Hopefully that answers your question, Michael. Um, yeah, so that's um, the Snow Rangers and, and Stewardship Program. Any other questions on those? Otherwise, I'm going to pivot and um, we'll start getting a little bit more into our kind of advocacy and, and access projects that we're working on. Great. Um, so the, the CFI question is, is relevant and um, Wanted to talk a little bit about um, access on the Decalibron 14ers. If you all are familiar with those, um, there's a, a set of four 14ers um, in Park County, which is near Alma and Fairplay area. Um, they're they're pretty accessible. They're they're pretty easy by by 14er standards, um, and they get a ton of use. Uh, and you may have heard recently that um, they are temporarily closed, and that is due to some private land issues that CMC has been working on actually for for over a decade since before I I started with the club. Um, but you know, essentially the the peaks, at least Democrat, Lincoln, and Bross are privately owned. Um, so there, the, the, the history of, of kind of mining in the, the Alma area and Fairplay area is, is extensive. And um, so there are, you know, thousands of, of acres of mining claims um, that are, are still, you know, people's technically their private property and they include the summits of these peaks as well as numerous areas along the trail, areas around Kite Lake, which is the most, um, most commonly used access point for these 14ers. Uh, and so we've been working with those private landowners um, actively for over, over a year now to address some of these issues. And re really the, the majority of their concerns revolve around liability. Um, and they are concerned that the, the Colorado recreational use statutes um, that, that normally would protect a, a private landowner from someone um, suing them if they get hurt on, on private land, um, those, those may not be strong enough in a lot of cases. And a lot of it has to do with this mining infrastructure on their property. And, and the way that the, the law reads right now, they would have to sign and close off um, every single uh, mine shaft opening or piece of rebar or potential hazard that they are aware of um, in order for, for someone not to sue them essentially. So um, they've got a lot of concerns. You know, if people stay on the trail, it's, you know, relatively safe and, and they're probably okay. But as soon as people start to wander off the trails and go poke their heads into to these these mine shafts and these these old sets of infrastructure um, there's a lot that could could potentially go wrong um, 
And so the, the liability piece has been the huge, the big kind of main main piece, but the other component is is just the the resource damage and um, the volume of people um, that that we're seeing on these 14ers on, on all 14ers really, but you know these in particular again because they're a little bit easier, a little bit more accessible. They're closer to the front range um, and they're they're easier to hike. So um, they're you know they're seeing human waste issues. They're seeing you know trash and and trash trail breeding and, and lots of just, just resource damage on these properties and on the, the trails surrounding them. So um, right now the, the kind of status is there's a temporary closure on the private parcels of land um, on these peaks, which again includes the, the summits of Demo Democrat Lincoln and, and Bross, as well as areas around Kite Lake. Um, the road into Kite Lake from Alma is, is kind of always closed this time of year until snow and mud season is over. Um, but we are anticipating a, a reopening on June 1st, and that kind of coincides with um, a, a lease that's in place through the town of Alma um, between the, the private landowner and, and the town of Alma. That helps address some of the um, liability issues. The town of Alma also manages the, the parking and the, the kind of permit that you pay for when you when you park up at Kite Lake. Um, so all of that should open up as, as normal and as expected on June 1st. But we are really asking folks to, to respect this closure and, and you know, find some other spots to, to hike and camp for the next couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, it's 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 tricky. We you know the the landowners, unfortunately or fortunately, I, yeah, they they do have the right to to close these properties. They are they are fully private property, um, and so they've they've been you know pretty gracious with us in the past and allowing recreation use up there. And so our goal is to to be able to maintain that access and find a solution um, that that works for them. Um, and so uh, we've got a question about whether there's any legislation on the docket, and the answer is no, not yet. Um, but we are looking into that and, and we're looking into it kind of carefully and strategically. We've put together a stakeholder group um, to kind of investigate further and, and see what the potential opportunities are um, to, to make some changes without um, setting off too many, too many red flags with certain groups and legislators and things. Um, so yeah, that, that process is underway. I would you know, think at the earliest, it'll be next year um, and next year's legislative session that, that there's any potential change. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we're doing work again you know, through this, this lease agreement with the town of Alma um, and other, other work up at, at that area and with these landowners um, to make sure we can, can maintain access. Um, and one thing in particular that we're, we're gonna be setting up this year um, is a series of, of trailhead surveys. Um, and we did one last year, um, our Connor Mar, our stewardship coordinator, went up to Kite Lake in August and basically, you know, from, from 5 a.m. to about 11, um, just hung out at the, at the trailhead and counted people and surveyed people and talked to them. And our, the report is on the website but he thought, you know, I mean, he counted, I think on that Saturday, 350 people um, who were, were hiking the peak. Um, he talked to about 100, 150 of them um, and, you know, was just questioning, you know, where they're from and how they found out about this area and whether or not they knew that the summits were private and whether or not they knew that the summit of Mount Bross is technically always closed and, and not legal um, for, for public access. Um, and, you know, questions about leave no trace and, and things like that. And yeah, pretty, pretty interesting results, um, as you might expect. Majority of folks kind of from the Denver metro area, um, but certainly a handful of, of out-of-staters and, and from folks from, you know, elsewhere in the state as well. Um, most folks were, you know, kind of getting their information from some sort of, of website, you know, some sort of online resources. Um, All Trails was, I think, the most common, um, and then 14ers.com was another big one. Uh, and, and so as part of the results of that survey, we actually contacted All Trails and had them update their information about these peaks to make sure that they included information about the private property that the summit of Bross was closed and, and these other components uh, as part of that education piece. Cause you know, I think 
again, a lot of people are, are well-intentioned, but just don't, just don't know, right? They, they maybe haven't done the research um, or the, the information is not out there in the places that they are researching. So we did some work after that, that survey um, to, to update those sites and, and try to get better information out there. But uh, we will be doing a series of surveys again. We're gonna try to put together um, a set of, of basically volunteer opportunities. So if you are interested in, in spending a morning out there um, counting folks and, and talking to people, um, it's, it's, I think it would be really interesting and, and a really cool way to, to volunteer for the club and help us collect some data. Obviously we give that to the forest service and to the landowners and, and just, you know, the, to understand the use patterns up there is going to also help in the ability to, to kind of better manage, manage use. Um, and so a couple of, of questions that came in here, um, asking if permitting is an option. Um, and that that is what the town of Alma does. And that's one, one thing that in the recreation use statute, if you, ch as a private landowner, if you charge for access, um, then you are, are more liable if somebody gets hurt. So, so the landowners themselves cannot charge, but the town of Alma can. Um, and they are essentially just charging for the, the parking, but they are, they're not, they're kind of exempt from, from that same liability expectation. So that, that's kind of the, the loophole or the, the workaround. Um, you know, I think at one point, you know, down the road there, there may be limited permitting, which there isn't currently, right? If you drive up there and, and buy a permit, you can, you can park and, and access it. You don't need to reserve it ahead of time. But that may be something that, that happens in the future is that there's a limited number of permits available each day and you've got to get those you know, in advance of, of going up to, to, to Kite Lake. So we'll, we'll see if that happens. I don't think it'll happen this year, um, but it may be something that, that happens down the road. Um, another, yep, so a perfect question about a, a trail rangers or education program. Um, and that's exactly kind of what we're planning to, to try and do this summer. It will be a, a volunteer um, program, so we won't we won't necessarily have paid staff up there. Um, but yeah, we're looking for kind of those those trailhead ambassadors that are willing to to give up you know a, a day and and hang out there. Um, it's a beautiful spot to to sit and hang out for sure. Um, so yeah, look for look for that. Hopefully in the next month, we'll, we'll have some dates and volunteer opportunities available. Um, and Jenna, yes, um, it, we have talked with CFI because they, they similarly have kind of a, a, a trail, you know, stewardship or trailhead ambassador program um, where they are collecting information and, and, and visitor use surveys. So we talked with them last fall about kind of coordinating efforts. They haven't been at Kite Lake, I don't think super recently, their focus has been on, on other peaks. So we're gonna try to coordinate and, and do, um, you know, make, make those opportunities available both to CMC members and also to, to CFI volunteers if they're, they're interested. Any other questions on the Decalibron issues? Um, and if you're if you're interested in this, um, we've got a blog up with um, links to. We did a, a panel with the land managers. Um, it was just about a year ago, um, or early summer last year, and it's really interesting to to just hear their their perspective. I've learned a lot more about mining in general, and and you know again some of the the liability issues that that they're dealing with um, is, I think, a good perspective to have from recreationists. Um, we've got some other resources and, and links from that blog, too. Um, and we just put up some information about the, the Kite Lake closure on social media. And, you know, I think for the most part, got, got good feedback. Um, we did have a couple people who were, you know, are pissed off, right? And they're, they're, they don't think mountains should be privately owned and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there's, I think, um, just different viewpoints on that, but I, I think given the, the situation that we have currently and the, the opportunity um, that we have available to work with these folks, um, we're better off kind of working with them and finding, you know, collaborative solutions um, than, than fighting against them and, and risking, you know, permanent closure of these peaks. Um, so good question about where the blog is. I'm going to try to put it in the chat. Uh, if I can remember, I think it's just blog.cmc.org. Um, 
and I can double check that and, and post it again later if that link doesn't doesn't work. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Any other questions on the Decalibron stuff? There it is. There's a good link. Thanks, Anna. Um, cool. Well, I'll keep moving here. Um, so I mentioned that you know CMC does policy and, and advocacy work, and a lot of this is centered around um, both wilderness designations and you know other other policy that relates to recreation, right? That's kind of our our niche. There are a ton of groups in Colorado and across the country that do you know wildlife conservation work or other public lands conservation work, um, and so we try to weigh in on on all of these things uh, with the recreation kind of kind of lens. Um, and so I'll talk about a couple of projects that we're working on. Um, one is is new potential wilderness legislation. You've probably heard about the Colorado Wilderness Act and the CORE Act. Um, these have been in the works, both of them, um, Colorado Wilderness Act for, for about 20 years. Um, the CORE Act is, is more recent, but a um, kind of culmination of other work um, that was formerly the, the Hidden Gems Wilderness Proposal and has had various other names Names. Um, but these, in total, these, these two um, bills that are now in, in, they're wrapped into another bill called the Protecting America, America's Wilderness Act, um, they would protect over a million acres of Colorado public lands, um, which is a, a pretty big chunk and a pretty incredible statistic um, and includes some really amazing landscapes. Um, you know, those that are of interest to recreationists or, you know, some of them are, are listed here. Um, but there's also a really wide variety of Bureau of Land Management um, lands out on the, the western slope um, that aren't your typical we call rock and ice wilderness, right? A lot of our, a lot of the peaks in Colorado um, and the kind of high alpine um, ecosystems are, are actually already protected as, as wilderness, um, but much fewer areas in, in the canyon lands and sort of the the desert and um, sagebrush steppe types of ecosystems, um, most of those are, are not protected um, in Colorado. So the Colorado Wilderness Act in particular um, really does a good job of, of getting some of these, these different ecosystems intact and um, converting a lot of what are called wilderness study areas to full, full wilderness protection. Um, and so these um, have kind of kind of been in play, have, have made it through the house um, twice now, once last session and, and again kind of early in this session. And we're really waiting on movement in the Senate and that's where the, the challenge has been. Um, we are always looking for folks to send letters to your senators, encouraging them, them to support these. Um, and, and we have good senators in, in Colorado typically that are supportive of public lands, um, but they've had trouble moving these, these bills forward. So the more support they can get, um, the more, you know, again, kind of endorsement they have from, from local folks to, to move forward on this. And um, we'll certainly, you know, through our action alerts, uh, let folks know if there's movement on these and if there's a, a good opportunity um, to comment and, and send letters and um, to kind of advocate for, for these bills and, and these protections. Any questions on the Colorado Wilderness Act or CORE Act? Um, if you are not on the action alert list, um, on the cmc.org slash conservation website, um, you can sign up for our, our conservation e-newsletter. So if you get that newsletter, we send it about once a month and that you're on, you're on the action alert list. Um, and if you don't get it, you can, can sign up on the website. Um, you can also always just see our action alerts on the website under the conservation page. There's an action alerts page and it'll always have the, the most active ones up there for you to, to comment at any time. So you can always check there too. Um, some state legislation that we are working on um, kind of in the, the background is this was introduced Oh, two weeks ago now, pretty recently. Um, and I don't know if, uh, how, how much folks have, have heard about it. We've done a little bit of outreach, but um, there is a new proposal for what's called, they're calling the Colorado Go Wild Pass. 
Um, and essentially what this would do is replace the annual state parks pass that folks purchase. It's that $80 pass, you get the sticker for your window and you can get into all the, the state parks. It would actually replace that with a fee on vehicle license registration. So when you register your vehicle every year, there would be an additional fee. Um, you can opt out of it, or that that's the proposal is that you'd be able to opt out if you, you know, if you don't use the parks pass or don't don't want it on every single one of your vehicles. Um, but it would be sort of added on there automatically, and the price would be significantly reduced. So the maximum price that they could charge is, is half of the current annual pass of $40. They're actually shooting for a price point more in the, the $20 to $30 range for that annual pass. So if you're a recreationist and you, you already buy a state parks pass, it's a, it's a great deal, right? You get a reduced pass price. Um, and the goal is to get more folks buying these, these passes. Um, so they've, you know, they've crunched the numbers and 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 figured out that if they get, you know, at, at 20 bucks a pass, if they get, you know, 40% participation, they're actually going to be making more money than they do off the current $80 pass. So um, it's a it's a really cool, um, cool opportunity. And um, it's it's moving through the Colorado state legislature legislature right now. Um, it passed through the House Natural Resources Committee last Last week it goes to um, finance and then appropriations next week. So it's moving along there, you know, some potential pushback um, because of the, the concerns about the opt-out process and, and sort of a new fee on, on vehicle registrations. But I think overall there's a lot of support for it. Um, and some some good, hopefully good outcomes, um, you know, not only for state parks, but for some other programs. So the main goal is to, to you know, get more funding for the, the state parks, just operations and, and maintenance. They're, they are, you know, as, as most agencies are, they are underfunded and, and struggling to keep up with kind of the influx of, of visitors um, and just the maintenance needs at, at their parks. Um, so there's a big chunk, obviously the majority of the funding goes goes back into state parks. Um, but assuming they, they kind of hit that fund, funding goal, they've actually, they'll allocate um, 2.5 million for search and rescue, which is huge. Um, and as we know, again, we've seen more and more folks just, just struggling out in the in the back country and, and needing those resources that search and rescue provides and and those programs are you know volunteer um, run and and staffed for the most part and and just really you know short on on resources so a big chunk of funding for them a big chunk of funding for the Colorado Avalanche Information Center to increase and expand their programming which is awesome um, and then they've got another another a number of other priorities in sort of a, a third tier of funding. So if they're able to cover all the state parks stuff, all the search and rescue and CAIC costs, then they'll have money that splits up um, between the, the parks and wildlife side of, of CPW and go into things like um, diversity programs, conservation efforts, um, acquiring new properties for, for new state parks, that, that sort of thing. Um, so, so some really cool potential outcomes if that, that funding mechanism is successful. Um, so we'll see uh, how things move forward. We do have an action alert up on, on this as well to thank the folks that introduced the bill and then encourage your, your state legislators to support it if they aren't already. Um, we expect it to, to move fairly quickly. So hopefully we'll know, you know, in the next, you know, before the, the end of this session, um, whether it's, it's happening or not. However, the actual rollout for the pass would not be until January, 2023 at the earliest. So for the next, you know, year and a half, two years, um, still plan on, on buying that annual state parks pass if you, if you do, or if you plan to use it. Um, and then potentially by 2023, it'll just kind of show up on your, your vehicle registration. So we'll, we'll keep you posted on that, but that's kind of a cool one. Okay, I'm gonna move through this these last couple um, fairly quickly here because I've, I've been talking too much and I wanna make sure we've got some time for questions at the end too. Um, we've been working on forest planning out on the Western Slope for a number of years, um, really in close coordination with Outdoor Alliance, which is a national 
recreation advocacy group that includes all of those um, those symbols, those groups that you see uh, logos for at the top there. Um, and so really we're you know focused on the, the recreation aspects of this forest plan that are going to impact you know future recreation development, winter recreation and travel planning. Um, and so working with, with the agencies and, and user groups kind of in, in that area. Um, the GMUG, so again, that's the Grand Mesa, Uncompahgre, Gunnison Forest, um, covers a huge swath of, of Western Colorado, basically from um, Crested Butte and, and even east of there a little bit, all the way um, through the Northern San Juans, um, across the Uncompahgre Plateau, and then up onto the Grand Mesa outside of Grand Junction. So really big forest, um, a lot going on. We are expecting a draft plan from them this summer. We don't know exactly when, but um, so we'll have some action alert and commenting opportunities um, on for this plan, especially if it's, you know, if you recreate in any of those areas, that goes such a long way um, with the with the agencies and having those voices um, for for, you know, recreation opportunities and, and better management. So. Um, the last big thing I want to talk about um, is our Recreation Impact Monitoring System, or RIMS. Um, and a lot of you may have hopefully have heard about this by now, um, but this is a mobile app that we developed to collect data on public lands and help improve recreation management um, for land managers. You know, we know the agencies are, are understaffed um, and, and a lot of times don't have the, the time or the personnel to get out on all of the, the trails that they manage. Um, and this is a way for, you you know, CMC members, our staff, recreationists in general, and just the general public to sort of be the, the eyes and ears out on the ground and report stuff back to the agencies. Um, so we've got a, a number of different types of, of issues and reporting assessments that you can submit. Um, you, you know, include surveys and notes and photos uh, to identify these issues and really help land managers you know, have all the information they need to go out and, and address them. Um, if you go to um, cmc.org slash app or slash RIMS, um, you can, can check out, we've got a training online. Um, you can download the app from there and, and kind of learn more about the program. But I'll show you just a, a couple of quick snapshots of, of what it looks like. Um, I mentioned we had we launched the app in July 2019, so we're coming into our third full field season, um, and we've got over 800 folks using the app. Um, a good percentage of those are, are CMC members, um, but a lot of them are, are also folks um, that are either you know associated with other trail or stewardship groups. They may be land managers. They may be, um, you know, conservation core crew or other, you know, trail crew um, professionals and, and yeah, folks all over the state and actually now all over the country using RIMS. Um, we've got two big out of state projects, one in Alaska and one in Oregon, where we've got user groups and, and land managers um, that are that are using the program there. So it's kind of been cool to, to see that expansion um, even even beyond Colorado and, and see this the CMC name um, elsewhere elsewhere in the world. Um, we've got you know close to 5,000 assessments in the app that, that folks have submitted on all these different issues. And then of course we're working really closely with with land managers um, to make sure they're they're able to access and, and use the data. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, just some, you know, kind of basic features of the app is, you know, you're dropping a pin and, and collecting information, taking photos, um, and of course doing all of this offline, right? So if you're in the backcountry or in an area where you don't have cell service, you can use the app, capture all that information, and then when you're back in service, upload it all to the cloud. We've got these, you know, drop down surveys and, and kind of questions to make the assessments as objective as we can, because a big goal of this is really having good data that the land managers can can use um, for planning to, you know, line out their crews to go deal with this work, um, that that sort of thing. So we try to be as, as objective and, and detailed as, as possible. 
And then on the back end, we're setting up these customized dashboards for land managers so they can actually go in and see their data for their specific geographic region in real time and get a sense for what's going on, drill into different you know, spreadsheets or maps or graphs or charts, um, get automated reports and, and statistics that are that are updated, you know, again in, in real time as information is coming into the app. And then our goal, of course, is, you know, is that this, this data is really used both in the, the short term. Um, we've seen uh, agencies and uh, volunteer organizations use it for, for rapid response project, right? Somebody submits a, a, an assessment saying that there's a bunch of downed trees on a trail. They can send their trail crew out or their volunteers out the next week to get those cleared out. Um, otherwise, they, they might not know about them for you know several weeks or a month or however long. Um, so those kind of rapid response projects have been really successful. And then now that we're starting to get a, get a couple of years of, of data, these kind of midterm and long-term opportunities are, are popping up um, for you know longer planning projects for grant writing we actually cmc used rims data that we collected on the trail last year to write a grant proposal and we had really detailed specs about the maintenance that needed to to be done we had great pictures we had all the information we we needed to kind of plan out this project make sure we had the right resources to then send our crews out there this year to to make it happen so um, we're starting to see all of that that come together and um, a good question about what kind of you know feedback we're, we're getting from the agencies um, um, and yeah, the, the feedback has been been good. And right now, you know, we're working um, with a, a handful of different forest service districts and BLM um, offices in, in the state that are using either a dashboard or um, a, a mapping a GIS data service with the data. Um, and that's been been really cool to see those we go through a custom setup process with them. And um, so now they're they're able to kind of have quick quick access to that that the you know that that information. I think sometimes the the trick with with the agencies is is making it really you know simple and and easy for for them to use. Um, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of information to process. If you've got hundreds or thousands of data points coming in, you know, on a on a given district or in a given county, um, so figuring out how we process help them process that and help them analyze it in a way that's that's useful in a way that they can manage um, has has been good. Um, so yeah, that kind. I, hopefully, Michael speaks to, to your question about um, how are they, you know, are they able to actually use that data and, and make changes in their management? And I think we're, we're still seeing that, right? It's still a process of, of collecting it, analyzing it, providing it in a way that they can, can really use. And we're constantly updating the app. We're constantly tweaking kind of the, the back end technology and functionality and, and making it both more user friendly so that it's easy for volunteers to collect data, but then also, you know, friendly for the, the agencies to be able to, to see it and process it. So. Great. Um, well, I have uh, talked at you guys quite a bit, um, and I appreciate your attention and engagement and great, great questions. Um, that's the the link there to the RIMS website, but I'm happy to take, um, yeah, any other questions about any of the, the topics I covered. Oh, I'm not doing that. Yeah, feel free to unmute if you I'd like to ask Julie a question. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate Oh, we got a good question in the chat. What's the best way to become more involved in conservation? Um, I would say that the two easiest ways are through the RIMS mobile app um, and, and just, you know, providing information while you're out. If you're out hiking, it can be as simple as, you know, taking 
two minutes at the trailhead when you show up to, to count the number of cars in the parking lot and document, you know, how many hikers, how many mountain bikers you, you saw while you were out. Um, or, you know, if you come across a downed tree, literally, you know, 30 seconds and you can take a quick picture um, and, and submit that. That's, that's huge. Um, the other way is, you know, signing up for our, our e-newsletter um, and engaging in those action alerts. Um, that's, that's really huge. It's important that, you know, our legislators and, and land managers hear from um, recreationists and, and have the opportunity to, to kind of hear about your personal experience recreating on, on public land and how their decisions um, impact that. So those are probably the best ways to get involved. Thanks. Cool. And um, thank you guys all for engaging tonight. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out if, if there are any other questions. Thanks, Julie. Awesome presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Everybody have, have a great night. Have a great night.